The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. And again, today we're going to talk about the crosstalk between gut and brain in a autistic spectrum disorder um, and, you know, the prerogative, uh, um, you know, um, uh, title is to do they understand each other. And again, in the past few years, uh, we had so many new information in the field that I believe that again, we start to really untangle what is going on in between what we technically call this gut and brain access. So the objective of what we're going to discuss today is to try to really connect the dots between genes, environment, and, you know, the gut mucosa. And we know, understand some of the key players, definitely, of course, because of the objective of what we discussed, the intestine seems to be, uh, you know, at the crossroad of this crosstalk. Definitely we know the involvement of environmental factors, and there are several they have been advocating to be trigger or facilitator of the clinical outcome that leads to the autism. And we're going to discuss, of course, the intestine as the battlefields where friends and foes need to be distinguished. Now these new elements, the eye, the bacteria that live with us from birth to death, what we call technical and microbiome seems important. And in uh, connecting all these players, we are trying to understand how we come up with the clinical outcome that will eventually involve brain functions that are characteristic of the clinical outcome that is typical of this spectrum disorders. Now, this concept that intestine seems to be important for many diseases were really put forward many, many, many years ago by the father of all the physicians, Hippocrates, that, uh, you know, one of his most famous quotes is, all disease begins in the gut. There was a lot of wisdom in that statement, indeed, uh, we know that the intestine mucosa is truly a battlefield in which every day friends and foes need to be recognized, distinguished, and then properly managed to reach the, those ideal balance that we call tolerance, i.e. state of health, or immune response, or fight these enemies that will may eventually lead to disease. So, um, the uh, GI disorder in, in kids with autism has been, uh, for many, many years, uh, been, uh, uh, you know, described on the clinical ground. And again, we never understood if there was a correlation uh, between, uh, you know, GI symptoms and uh, neurological symptoms as a cause-effect relationship, or simply there was just, uh, you know, a casual, you know, relationship with the two elements being totally distinguished from one each other. You see in this slide that, you know, the overall prevalence of GI problems in kids with autism has a wide range from 9 to 91 percent, meaning from almost never to almost always. Uh, and and the, the reason of this, this wide range is due to the fact that we have really little understanding how frequent are these conditions when we go to uh, you know, the different subgroups. For example, if we consider the objective sinus symptoms, the ones in which you do not have any, you know, role of interpretation of the kid should not communicate if he or she feels something wrong with her belly or his belly, those are easy uh, to figure it out. For example, constipation, diarrhea, belching, vomiting, flatulence, those are symptoms that, you know, are objectively there. Anybody can really record the symptoms. And you see the prevalence there, this range based on what has been reported in literature. Much more complex is, you know, the sign of symptoms for which the subject and or the family needs to report. So, abdominal pain and discomfort, typical example. How do we know if the kid is really crying or, you know, have repetitive behavior because has stomachache or because something else? And the same apply for enteric infection, what we call the dysbiosis inflammation in the stomach, gastritis, reflux, that seems to be a big deal, but again, you know, the, you know, kids, particularly the ones that can't communicate, you know, uh, will have, you know, gastroesophageal reflux, it will express itself clinically with some, you know, a stereotype repetitive, you know, uh, behavior or, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, aggressivity and so on and so forth. 
and then, of course, the leaky gut, maldigestive absorption. And that's the reason why you see all question marks beside of all this, you know, reported suspected sinus symptoms. So now, with a better understanding what we're dealing with, uh, and the better understanding, most likely, autism has now been reclassified as an autoimmune disease, like diabetes, multiple sclerosis, celiac disease, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, the question is, um, where are the ingredients of this recipe? Uh, definitely, there are there is a genetic component that we know now, but there are several evidence that genetics plays a role. Definitely, we know the environment. It's important because of some of the studies suggest the environment can have a pivotal role to lead to allergies. And the third element, the one that you see in the middle here, that, that pertains again to the butterfield of the intestine. So this possibility of the intestine to really lose the capability to keep at bay the bad guys, i.e., you know, the instigators come from the environment because of a leaky gut, so in a loss of mucosal battery function, seems to be the three elements that play a, a role leading to the clinical outcome with, you know, of course, target being the immune system, the brain, and the digestive, uh, you know, system, and so on and so forth. So let's look, look at these three elements, start with genes. Now that, you know, the Human Genome Project has, has been completed a while ago, and we know much more about human genetics than we used to, and now we have the capability to pinpoint genes that are mutated in specific conditions, including others. Now we can map it out, so to speak, you know, which genes and on which chromosomes are affecting specific diseases. And here you see a map of all the studies that have been done so far um, that seems to be involved in the uh, pathogenesis of autism. So you see the different chromosomes named from numbered from 1 to 22, and then the two sexual chromosomes, X and Y. And each of these, you know, red dot, uh, lane is indicating a gene map that there's a specific chromosome in which a mutation links specific to autism has been found. So you see, you know, areas very crowded, like so chromosome 7, uh, chromo chromosome 13, chromosome 16, uh, in which there are many genes mutated uh, uh, and linked with uh, autism. And, 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 and that's, you know, this is giving us the confidence that the genetic component is important. I want to point out something quite interesting. There are several genes related to autism on the X chromosome, the, the chromosome that phenotypically it's the female chromosome, why there are no genes uh, associated with autism on the Y chromosome. And this may give reason why, for, uh, you know, autism is more frequent in boys than in girls, because in girls, having two copies of the X chromosome, if one of these two copies has a mutated gene, so a gene that doesn't work and, and, and it's increased the risk for autism, the other one can compensate if the, the, the same gene is not affecting the second copy. While in, in boys, this composition cannot occur because there is no counterparts of the X chromosome. We still talk about genetics. What about environment? Well, we don't have, you know, a, an undisputable evidence of a specific environmental trigger that leads to uh, autism. But definitely, there are a lot of circumstantial evidence that suggests that uh, the environment plays a tremendous role. Uh, for example, not just in autism, but many other neurodevelopmental disorders in general, there are increased concern about environmental exposure. Uh, there are definitely <coughs> uh, data on the mechanism by which this environmental triggers, uh, metals, uh, foodstuff, and so on and so forth can cause autism. So that's another piece of the puzzle that is coming up, and it's pretty obvious. The fact that we do not have a definite genetic model that can recapitulate by itself without the intervention of the environment, uh, the clinical outcome of autism is, really speaks against genetics being the only determinant for autism. And then, of course, you know, there are, you know, this descriptive data on recent rise and autism prevalence, so we are in, in, in the midst of an epidemic too fast to be uh, due to mutation of the genes, but definitely uh, suggesting that, you know, we are changing the environment, you know, uh, quite dramatically without giving the time to our genes to adapt to the new uh, situation. And finally, and last but not least, the epidemiologic data on environmental exposure and autism that, you know, there are 
clearly accumulating evidence there. But you know, there are many theories. They are not final proof yet, but it is what lawyers will call circumstantial evidence. Among the um, environmental triggers, definitely gluten and casein have been the ones that received the most attention of all. As a matter of fact, the gluten-free casein-free diet is one of the most popular interventions in kids with allergies. So what are the facts? What do we know about those, these two elements? Well, starting with gluten, <coughs> this is an interesting, uh, um, um, you know, evidence. Um, the uh, fact that, again, gluten containing grains that belongs to this uh, um, uh, tribe that's called Ordi, to which wheat, barley, and rye and barley, the, the grains containing gluten belongs to, um, are, you know, the most recent in the evolution. So, in other words, of the 2.5 million years that the human species evolved, 99.9% .9 of our ancestors have been gluten-free. It's been only in the past, you know, 10,000 years when they changed dramatically the lifestyle from nomadic settlers. So, in other words, with the advent of agriculture, that uh, gluten-containing grains uh, came into the picture. So we did not evolve to deal with gluten. When I say we, I mean we all. Uh, of course, you know, the vast majority of us can eat gluten without consequences, but I feel that because of this peculiarity of this protein that is very unique, may have, you know, clinical outcome that can lead among the others possibly to others. So we talk about the environment, we talk about the genes, what about this intestinal barrier, leaky gut? Well, there are some interesting facts about this, you know, um, organ. It's a long tube in adults that's 20 feet long. In the past, it was conceptualized as a the tube that was cored by single layer cells. That's it. That's what really divides us from uh, uh, harmful elements from the environment. And all the physiologists, I expert of physiology of the gastrointestinal tract, conceived the, 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 the intestine um, layer as a sort of uh, floor in which each cell uh, was a tile and everything in the cell was sealed by a sort of grout cement so that anything that from the environment, either the intestinal lumen or come in our body, has to come through the cells. <coughs> also, the, this 20 feet long tube is not smooth but is, you know, has these hills and valleys, what we call, you know, folds and villi that increase dramatically what is the surface that we interface with the environment. If we take in the intestine of an adult that was spread on the floor, we we'll call a double tennis course, 3,000 square feet. So a huge interface with the environment. So, so many things can go back and forth. And, you know, so many things can go wrong if we are not good enough to distinguish between friends and foes. So, this was until the late 80s. And then a Japanese group said, you know, it, the space in the cells is not sealed. There is no cement that closed this space. This is a cartoon, one cell and a neighbor cell. And we thought that here everything was closed. They said actually there are doors that, you know, they we technically we call tight junctions. Most of the time closed, but sometimes they can be open so the stuff can come through. And for the full decade, there is a, a, a growing evidence in the literature of the composition of these doors, but we never discovered the key, I, who opened these doors until the recent past, when we, by serendipity, stumble upon this molecule that we call zonulin, that turns to be, and it still is, the only physiological modulator that will instruct the cells to open these doors so the stuff can come from the environment in. And they're very, very tightly controlled. Now, as typically happens in physiology, when this, you know, control lose, you know, that tight, you know, check, and therefore, rather than to keep these doors almost always closed and only occasionally open them to let stuff to go through, problem will arise. And this is the basis of what is the leaky gut theory in which we have very few facts because this is a work in progress, we're still learning, and a lot of fantasies in which, you know, people in the past claim that the leaky gut syndrome is responsible for many, many things. What we know is a fact. We know that tight junctions, i.e. these doors, are really the gates that open and close 
in response of some many stimuli, some internal from our body, like zonulin, and some external stimuli. That, and, and we do this because we need this, because this is the way that we do a lot of functions that keep us healthy. <clears throat> but when, again, this control of these gates goes out of whack, so there is no more closed doors all the time, but it's mostly open doors all the time, then we have problems that can arise, particularly situations like inflammatory diseases, like, again, many autoimmune diseases, irritable bowel syndrome, and so on and so forth. The other thing that is interesting about this key, this zonulin, is one that, you know, the precursor of this zonulin uh, is very ancient. As a matter of fact, this zonulin, uh, you know, ancestor came into the picture 400 million years ago when fish, they split from the rest of the animal kingdom. The real deal, the real zonulin, came um, into the picture only two, uh, two million years ago. So 500,000 years when we split for our first cousin chimpanzee. All this to say that zonulin, this key that open tight junction is produced only by humans, but not by animals. And matter of fact, you know, um, many conditions in which there is a leaky gut, including autoimmune disease, you know, prevalently or almost exclusively affect human beings. The other thing that is interesting that is the, the uh, genes of zone has been mapped on chromosome 16. Again, it's a chromosome that is very crowded in terms of genes that are um, involved in autism. And, and again, um, you know, on this chromosome that, uh, you know, hosts the harbor 3% of the entire human genome, so only 1,300 genes, is packed with genes that are linked to three major categories of diseases, namely autoimmune disease, cancer, and pertinent to our discussion today, disease of the nervous system, uh, including Lugari disease, lipodystrophy, autism, as I've mentioned several times, and multiple sclerosis. When the genes with zone was cloned and mapped over here, people start to look at where these genes were associated in terms of disease, and once again, disease the nervous system, including multiple sclerosis, schizophrenia, light it up. So there are these conditions in which there is an involvement in zonin. And now, new data seems to suggest that even in autism, zonin seems to play a role. So how zonin is released, how we can link this intestinal barrier, I leaky gut, with environmental triggers that can bring to problems. Well, again, uh, gluten that we know that can be one of the environmental triggers for, uh, you know, um, uh, autism, it's able uh, to instigate the gut to release this molecule and therefore to make the intestinal leak. And this is a cartoon that shows, uh, you know, one of the key components of gluten is called alpha gliden. Now, proteins are, can be compared to a sort of pearl necklace um, in which, uh, you know, each pearl is a, a single component that we call amino acids. In order to make use of, of proteins, what we need to do is to break the necklace, cut in pieces, what we call technically peptides, and then peel off these amino acids one at a time. And this is what we can do with most of the proteins that we ingest with our diet, with the exception of this molecule here. We, because we didn't evolve to eat gluten, we do not have the enzymes, i.e. the scissors, that will cut this uh, necklace and therefore allow us to peel this amino acid one at a time. So the best that we can do is to cut in pieces. And when these pieces will come through the intestine, will be seen as enemy from, by the immune system and will eventually set an immune response that, you know, if wrong, leads to inflammation and therefore to disease. Some of these pieces that are undigested, like these two blue ones here, are the ones that will instruct the intestine to release zonulin. So interestingly enough, gluten causes release of zonulin itself, so opening a, a, a shortcut in between the cells through these open gates that allow gluten to come in and eventually set an immune response if you're genetically skewed. So all of this to say that everybody that eats gluten can have an intestinal leaks because this, you know, release of zone happen in everybody. But not everybody will have consequences because of this leak. Because for the vast majority of people, when eat gluten, that will eventually instruct the cell to release zone and therefore to open these gates in between cells. And stuff like gluten and other stuff comes in, 
immune system will see this and will clean the mess. And we don't even know that this happened. But for a small subgroup of individuals, including probably kids with autism, this will have consequences that we will see in a moment. So what are the evidence that the intestine of kids with uh, um, autism leaks? Well, there are a few studies out there. This is a study that was published two, three years ago by an Italian group. They showed um, here in the graph the permeability that they got measured by this double sugar test, lactose mannitol, that in autistic kids compared to normal kids, their intestine leaks more. Interestingly enough, also their relatives intestine leaks more than um, control adult counterparts. But once again, these individuals, they don't have any problems, meaning that, you know, a leaky gut is not automatically meaning that you're going to put you in trouble. It may be a necessary but not sufficient condition to have a clinical outcome like autism. Even more interesting in this other part of the graph is the fi fact that when you, uh, when these kids that had the leaky gut were placed on a gluten-free, casein-free diet, they were able to bring back uh, the barrier function of the intestine to normal levels, comparable to normal kids. So the intestine leaked less when, uh, um, you know, they were placed on a gluten-free, casein-free diet, prob probably because the, um, the, the production of zonulin that makes the intestine leak went down. Uh, because, as I told you, gluten can uh, make the intestine release its own one. The fact that, you know, again, there is a, a leakiness of the gut and therefore an, a, 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 a gain into our body of this fragment of the gluten is justified and supported by papers like this one here <coughs> that show that kids with autism, they have an increased amount of antibodies against, um, you know, gluten you can mount an immune response uh, against gluten, therefore antibodies against, you know, uh, gliding, anti-gliding antibodies, if indeed you have three conditions. Your intestine, you eat gluten, your intestinal leak, gluten comes through into our body, and therefore the immune system, seeing this as an enemy, would mount an immune response against it. And interestingly enough, the level of IgG, anti-gliding antibodies in autistic kids, was higher than um, the level that were found in their siblings and the healthy unrelated kids uh, uh, that use con as control. Right? The IgA levels did not differ. Um, and, and again, um, you know, this was, uh, you know, uh, compared to other antibodies that we see, uh, you know, present in, in individuals with celiac disease, namely the amidated gliden and, and, and uh, anti-TTG antibodies and only the anti antibodies were elevated in kids with autism. Similar results were reported by another, you know, paper, another group uh, that showed that, you know, kids with autism uh, on a regular diet like the other paper had elevated anti antibodies that, interestingly enough, went back to normal when these kids were placed on a gluten-free diet. And, and again, uh, this is a quite interesting findings, um, and, and this was also the case for the anti-casein antibodies, anti-casein IgG antibodies elevated in kids with autism on regular diet went back to normal levels in uh, kids that went on a gluten-free diet. So this can result to be a good biomarker of good compliance with the gluten-free casein-free diet. One more interesting finding was that also total Ig, the allergic, uh, you know, related antibodies, and those specific for milk, uh, they also were elevating kids with autism and went back to normal levels when they embraced a gluten-free diet, gluten-free casein-free diets. So, with that, we come to the most uh, recent evidence of uh, another key player uh, that is. Um, you know, the gut microbiome. That is something else that's uh, it's, it's extremely interesting that now is getting more and more steam of interest because of the role that the gut microbiome has been associated with many immune-mediated diseases. So, uh, you know, beside gliding, another strong stimulus for release zone and therefore to make intestinal leak is indeed the presence of microorganisms in the small intestine. Uh, what we call SIBO, or small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Um, and we also know that, you know, 
uh, this microbiome that was a black box until the recent past now is becoming more and more clear in terms of the role that plays in complex diseases like autism. <coughs> we were completely naive about the complexity, the importance of the microbiome until the recent past. But now we know that these are, you know, parallel civilization that lives in different districts of our bodies, a body including the skin, the mouth, uh, the genital tract, but most important because it's the most abundant of all, the microbiome in our intestine is the one that's more complex and more important in, um, you know, uh, maintaining uh, the equilibrium between health and disease. And again, what is now pretty obvious that we are made by more bacteria than our own cells. And so this is an amazing finding in the past few years. And this also brings to another, you know, evidence of something that was unexplicable until the recent past. So we always de declare ourselves the most sophisticated, you know, beings on the face of the earth. Uh, and mainly because probably because we're in charge of it and therefore we decide who is the most sophisticated of all. But when the human genome uh, project was completed, we learned surprisingly that we are very rudimental, genetically speaking. So we are made by only 25,000 genes. And most of them are identical to chimpanzee, that, as I, can, I told you. Uh, for many reasons uh, are very different from us, even their first cousin. And the question is, how this can be? How can a, 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 a human being that has only 25,000 genes, and for comparison, worms, the one that we used to go fishing, they have 90,000 genes, almost four times more genes than we do. How come that we are on the top of the chain here? And this is not, uh, you know, logical unless we consider the fact that we are the combination of what we are in terms of genetically speaking and also what we are in terms of this parallel civilization that we with us from birth to death that is the microbiome that complexly produce a hundred times more genes than we do. So my reading of this to really explain the unexplicable is that we indeed inherit the two parallel genomes and we are made by two genomes. The human genomes that we, again, inherited from, you know, our parents, that is stable, that would never change in composition, that if it has any mutation defects, the one that I showed you in the slides with the red lines, would not go away. But the fact that we have those genes that put our risk, for example, with autism, is not synonymous, that is destiny that we will develop autism. It's just the potential that we can do that. If we will indeed develop autism or not, depend on the second genome, i the microbiome. The ones that is, if we're lucky, we'll never get from our mother during a normal vaginal delivery. And I say lucky because you know if this genome is this microbiome is living in peace with our mother's genome, most likely we'll live in peace with our own genome. If we're not lucky and we're born by C section, then you know, bad guys and good guys indiscriminately will come in and may eventually set up a fight that can lead to a clinical outcome like ours. Not only that, but you know, even if we're born by vaginal delivery, so we have the good microbiome, the one that lives with us, this is extremely dynamic, can change over time. And many things like infections, antibiotic use, exposure to, uh, you know, other environmental triggers, diet, and so on and so forth, can really change the composition and therefore the dynamic of this interplay. So with that in mind, we have uh, been blessed by support by the uh, Audis Speaks with the Trailblazer Research to try to understand three clinical important, you know, uh, topics. So do we really have this crosstalk between the brain and the gut. Uh, is this crosstalk important for the, the clinical outcome that leads to autism? And if that's the case, can we find a way to eventually bring this crosstalk to a more, you know, peaceful discussion so that we can stop 
this continuous, you know, um, inflammation that leads to autoimmunity and in this case to a clinical outcome that leads to change in behavior ca characterize, you know, autism. So to do that, we set as a goal to define the biology of the GI dysfunction in autism and we approach this both through an animal model of autism and human clinical trial and again, our paramount goal is to eventually find a, a way to personalize treatment for autism and hopefully to try to stop and reverse the process that brought these kids to this parallel world in which they got into when they developed autism. So what is our work in hypothesis? Is that this biosis, so change in, in this composition of the bacteria, so we have the bad bacteria, the good bacteria, we instigate the zone release, we make the intestine leak, we have this uncontrolled passage of stuff from the environment, including <coughs> gluten, casein, uh, components of microorganisms that will set, you know, an immune response. So in other words, that, you know, when you see enemy, these immune cells will start to really fight by creating weapons to try to get rid of the enemy. But once they're activated, these immune cells, they can really fight by deploying weapons that create inflammation. If these cells, once armed, we stay mostly into the, uh, you know, uh, the intestine, they will create a collateral damage there and these are the kids that will develop GI symptoms. But some of these cells, for reasons they are not totally clear to us, once armed, they are programmed to leave the intestine and eventually to go to other districts, including the brain, where they create there a situation of inflammation that on a specific genetic background can lead to autism. So to give numbers, if we have a thousand cells that are now armed, and they all of them, they will go to the um, uh, brain. These are the kids that develop autism with no GI symptoms. If, on the other hand, we have, you know, um, most of this, I mean, some of these cells to stay in the intestine, uh, let's say 500, another 500 go to the brain, these are the kids with autism with GI symptoms. This is our current hypothesis. And that leads pretty much to the interpretation of all this. So let's compare the human genome as a piano with 25,000 nodes, one of its gene. And, you know, let's say that you need to extract 300 of these nodes to develop, you know, autism. As any other piano, if nobody sits there, the, the song, you know, autism is not played. So it depends who is going to piano player that, in our opinion, is the microbiome that will dictate what is the clinical outcome. And because this is dynamic, then, you know, again, this can really change over time. And, you know, let's say that Elton John is sitting to the piano and he's able to touch only 200 to 300 notes. So despite that you have the genes for autism, you're not going to develop it. But let's say that now you've got infections, you have antibiotic exposure, uh, you develop, you know, a, a, a change in the microbiome because you got vaccinated or because you take a trip somewhere, and now let's say the Ray Charles is sitting there. And Ray Charles now is able to touch all 300 nodes. Now, now, at any time, you have the clinical outcome that brings to autism. So again, that means that despite the of the genes, that's not destiny that you develop autism. If you do or do not, depend on the composition of the microbiome. And we can figure it out by reading the music that is played but this interplay between piano and piano player, what we call now the metabolo, that is a science that studied the composition and the amount of specific metabolites that are produced by this interplay. So to go back to the parallel between piano and piano player, if we know that Alto John is a safe player that will not lead to autism, and we can figure it out that, that this is what is being sitting in the piano by looking at the music is played, let's say pop music. But if all of a sudden we hear jazz music played, we know that now we have another piano player that is the one that will eventually do the autism, and therefore we know that down the road, over time, this can be somebody that will eventually uh, develop the problem. And therefore the idea is to identify, you know, this composition of genome and microbiome well in advance and when we see the metabolites that we know predictor of autism intervene 
and prevent this to happen. We know this already because through this pro project that I was telling you before, we already realized that, for example, there is a com change in the ma composition of microbiome with kids with autism. And specifically, we learned that the bad guys, the ones that create inflammation that are close to the subgroup of this family, the microbiome, are increasing kids with autism, while the good guy, the bacteria, the ones that keep the inflammation at bay, are reduced. So you have, you know, again, this disbalance, imbalance between bad guys and good guys that seems to lead more toward inflammation. And in terms of metabolites, again, now we have a way to distinguish who is who. And looking at specific metabolites, we can tell, for example, in his case, the kids with autism, they are the one in red. Uh, compared to the siblings here in blue and the controls in black, they are, you know, segregated more in this part. So we can really understand who is who by looking at the metabolites. And this is a similar example in which autistic kids are here control here so we can definitely know who is so. So all this to say and to wrap it up and conclude, with all these studies, do we have a magic bullet to treat autism? So in other words, can we find a single treatment that will fix the old kids with autism? The answer is most likely not. Uh, and again, this is a, a, the exemplification of how a misunderstanding of how to approach the problem leads to very frustrating outcome. This, for example, is a review of papers focused on the treatment of gluten casein free diet that aim at understanding is this diet really fix the problem or is useless. And in reviewing all the data in the literature, this particular exercise concluded that there were three, six studies that seems to be interpretable, three of which they said they were, it was definitely um, the, the gluten-free diet, gluten-free, casein-free diet was beneficial, but out of three that shows just the opposite, there was no benefit whatsoever. So we were left in the no man's land and the conclusion were that now the evidence for efficacy of this diet is poor but, you know, large-scale, good-quality, randomized control trial are needed. I personally don't believe so. I believe that larger study we still don't give the answer because, you know, autism, like many other complex diseases, is the final destination. How you got there can be different from one individual to another. And here I, you know, to exemplify what I'm trying to say, I'm giving you a simple concept here. Let's say we have 100 kids with autism of which, you know, 30 went to the final destination because this biosis, 20 with immune media diseases, genetic mutation, 5, and so on and so forth, and only 20 that went there because of, you know, gluten, uh, leaky gut, and, and, and casein. So if we put these kids on a gluten-free, casein-free diet, um, you know, and, uh, you know, n knowing that this diet can be effective only in this part of this pie here, you know, we will have only 20, 30 percent efficacy, meaning that, you know, the vast majority of the kids will not respond to this intervention. So we will conclude, you know, gluten-free casein free diet is useless for, for autism. Now, let's take exactly the same 100 kids. And before that we implement an intervention, we try to stratify this population by saying, of these 100 kids, which one got the final destination to the gluten and casein uh, sensitivity? And we identify, let's say, these kids over here, and then we target just this, and now we have 100% efficacy. So you see that the approach can really change the outcome dramatically if we go for what we call personalized medicine. So I want to conclude with a quote from, um, you know, one of my favorite cartoon movies that is Ratatouille. And this is a, a, a quote from uh, the critic Anton Ego, the character that throughout the movie was very skeptical that a rat can be a good cook. And at the end of the movie, he had to give up. He has to realize that, you know, uh, that's not the case. And this is the score that applies very much of what has been going on in autism. So, you know, uh, the quote is, you know, uh, the news is often unkind to new talent. I, I have to change this because I can't read the entire quote. The world is often unkind to uh, new uh, 
talents, new creation, and I would say new ideas. The new needs friends because if you're skeptical and you are uncomfortable to go out of the comfort zone because you want to work and I making your your science towards you know what is only the dogma chance exists that you know new findings will not be there. And the other part of the quote that I really prize is not everyone can become a great artist, but a great artist can come from anywhere. Meaning that you know not everybody may have the right answer to resolve the problem of autism, but that answer can come from anywhere. So no preconcept, open mind, and I believe that we'll be much better off. Great. We've gotten quite a few questions, and luckily quite a few of the questions are overlapping. So I think we can probably answer several questions just in uh, just a couple shots here. So one of the big themes um, we had questions about today was about fecal transplants. So this relates, I, you, you didn't touch on this at all. I don't know if that's a topic that you're familiar with, but have you had any insight about that process? <coughs> oh, very much so. As a matter of fact, you know, um, it, 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 for what we discussed, the possibility that there is a dysbiosis, I changed the composition of the microbiome, the question is what we can do to fix it. And, you know, the two major, you know, approaches are probiotics, i.e. to bring good bacteria to put back, you know, the neighborhoods of this microbiome in a balanced, peaceful, you know, composition, or fecal transplantation, i.e., you know, to bring a total new microbiome into the picture that, you know, hopefully will be less belligerent and, and, and keep these kids, you know, more, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a state of health. Um, again, the concept is still the same that applies to what we just discussed. Uh, theoretically, I believe that both fecal transplantation and, and, and uh, the, the use of probiotics or prebiotics to change the microbiome composition are both valuable and, and possible, you know, strategies. But once again, we can't do this blind. If we don't know first if there is a dysbiosis, and most importantly, what kind of imbalance is there, it's difficult to really intervene and fix the problem. And to make myself even more clear, uh, this goes back to the same issues that, for example, we face when um, Fleming, you know, discovered antibiotics. When, when Fleming discovered penicillin, we thought that all the infections can be treated with penicillin. So everybody got an infection was treated with penicillin. We know too well the disaster that came out from, you know, not customizing the treatment because now we have you know, bacteria that are resistant to penicillin. We know that there are bacteria that will never respond to penicillin. So all this to say, sure, probiotics, fetal transplantation possibilities, but can be implemented only when we understand what is wrong, if it is wrong, what is wrong, and therefore to customize it, how to fix it. The next question, they're asking about diagnosis of gut permeability. I've gotten quite a few questions about this where people are asking separately <coughs> about the diagnosis of celiac disease. So I think that's the first part of the question. How is that diagnosed? And then secondly, is there really a way to diagnose gut permeability that isn't celiac disease? That's right. So, um, you know, gut permeability is a common denominator of many diseases and not exclusive of severe disease. The diagnosis of severe disease is based on the presence of specific antibodies are uh, very specific, meaning that they are present almost exclusively in people with severe disease and very sensitive. That means that almost all people with severe disease would test positive with these antibodies. Um, and, and again, uh, problem with gluten, now we know it's not equal to celiac disease. In the past, you know, when, you know, people said, my kids with autism feel, you know, improve dramatically when they go on a gluten-free, casein-free diet, our response was, well, you know, if that's the case, he must, or she must have celiac disease. If that's for celiac disease, it's negative. They said, well, this kid doesn't have a business to go on a gluten-free diet. Not true anymore. So the two really do not. Uh, you know, overlap anymore. Now you can have other form of gluten reaction like gluten sensitivity in which you can test negative for celiac disease but still having problem with gluten. In terms of the diagnosis of leaky gut, uh, that's complicated because the only test now commercially available that is this double sugar test is very cumbersome, is very difficult to do, uh, will imply that the kids have to be 
uh, able to drink some sugars and then uh, collect the urine for five hours and then send this to a specialty lab and so on and so forth. But now in the pipeline there are tests that will measure zonulin that will tell you how leaky is your gut just by using you know a, a blood test uh, that hopefully will become commercially available soon. Okay, great. You've talked quite a bit about probiotics, and I've got a lot of questions about probiotics. Do you have any specific strains of probiotics that you recommend people explore if they're trying to treat their children or their own problems with GI issues? Absolutely not. And and again, this is in in, in you know in light of what I just said. But let's say, for example that, you know, we have two kids with, with autism, uh, both with dysbiosis. One, because one of the good bacteria, let's say, lactobacilli is decreased, um, and, um, and the other kids in which another good bacteria, bifidobacteria, is decreased. So if I don't know what is wrong, which one uh, are we going to suggest? Let's say that I give a bifidobacteria to the kids that have a problem because of decreased lactobacilli. You're not going to have any benefit from that. But the same, you know, probiotics, with, you know, bifidobacteria, give it to the kids in which bifidobacteria is deficient may have benefits. So I think that, again, there is not a single bullet that will fix them all. It needs to be customized. So we need to understand first what is the dysbiosis and then give the pro probiotic. And so I, I'm assuming through, you're suggesting through stool and urine tests and blood tests that could come to a better understanding of what probiotic that's right. That's right. And again, this is something that it's now just come to fruition. So I believe that in a relatively short period of time, we will move from a research enterprise, i.e., the definition of microbiome for research purposes, to a business enterprise and, and clinical enterprise in which routine labs can tell us the composition of microbiome and what kind of dysbiosis we have. Excellent. Okay, you talked a little bit about personalized medicine. Um, can you speak just a little bit more to that? Yeah, again, uh, you know, now everybody, you know, agree that, you know, um, we, even if for diseases that we thought that were more homogeneous, like severe disease, diabetes, um, you know, um, you know, some form of cancer, so you say, you know, this, this is it. So if, if I have that problem, um, I will have that drug, that intervention that will fix them all. And again, we realize that's not the case. And, and, and if you look at, you know, the, the development of drugs for any kind of disease, uh, the Food and Drug Administration will give you the stamp of approval when the drug is rich efficacy, i.e. that will, will give a, a, a good outcome in 30, 35 percent of the people. That's it. We know already that two out of three that would take well, that specific pill would not respond to it. And, and again, this is the consequence that, again, we make the, you know, inappropriate assumption that these are all homogeneous diseases, but they are not. And if we understand that, again, you can get to the final destination of autism from different directions, let's say, uh, you know, my kids went to uh, that final destination because of oxidative stress, and your kids went because of uh, a food intolerance. It's pretty obvious that if, if your kids will be put on a gluten-free case and free diet, would not respond. Because, you know, again, uh, his problem was, you know, uh, the problem with, uh, you know, oxidative stress. Mine will respond because mine went there because of the food intolerance. So that's the reason why I believe that, you know, personalized medicine, even now, uh, that is a, 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 a backbone of the, the healthcare reform is going to be the way to go. All right, a final question. A lot of people had questions about different diets, so I'm sure you're aware there are a lot of different diets pe that people use when their kids are on the spectrum. Do you have any thoughts about different nutritional approaches, or do you feel that people need to work closely with a physician to determine? Uh, you know, again, uh, I'm being somebody that came into the picture relatively really recently, and again, I called as a, a, a not an expert of autism because I'm not. I'm not, you know, somebody that can really claim that I am an expert in, in autism. But definitely, I know a little bit about the gut and nutrition and so on and so forth. The impression that I I got when I got into, you know, um, the the network of people that are working on autism is that there's been a lot of uh, give it a try approach. 
So in other words, not much of a rational, but because there is the possibility of let's try this or that and so on and so forth. And again, this is creating a lot of confusion and anecdotal reports, uh, including the kind of diet that may eventually be beneficial. And again, I'm not saying that you know a, a diet that seems to be beneficial for one child uh, is completely bogus. What I'm saying is that you know to go from there and say that diet will be good for everybody, and that's complicated. And again, nutrition is extremely important and place the kids of any kind of diet that can limit the amount, ideal amount and balance of nutrients, minerals, vitamins is something that you cannot take very lightly. It has to be done under close, close um, supervision of a knowledgeable dietitian and again considered only when there is a rational that that diet may indeed eventually uh, have a, a benefit outcome, but not on an anecdotal, you know, uh, report because one family had a good outcome, then I give it a try because I want to give it a try. I, I think that we have to do better than that.